Savior. We're going to talk about him this morning. First John, if you would open your Bibles, please. While you're doing that, I want to uh, emphasize what Devin spoke about our marriage conference. You know, Teresa and I uh, love, love, we just absolutely love doing that ministry together. And this year, in light of COVID still being what it is, uh, we decided rather than uh, do a retreat, we thought that might be a little more challenging, uh, we would just do a conference here at the church, a one-day event this year, and then hopefully retreats in the future. But um, we're going to do that one-day conference, and um, I know that it's a little short notice, as with many things we're seeking to do in 2021, because of 2020, we were unable to plan like we had wanted to. But anyway, we want to do that, so uh, please consider being part of that. Because of COVID, we want to be able to prepare for that uh, as well, so your sign-up would be uh, just huge help to us, so please do that. We also thought in having it here, uh, kind of a restart f- uh, for our ministry, be a great opportunity for you to invite someone who might not go away, but might come here for a day. So consider whom you might invite. Use that as an outreach opportunity. They can be a believer. They don't, they don't have to be a believer. They can be a believer. It doesn't matter. If you know someone you'd like to invite, they can be part of another church as well. Um, anybody, just let us know. Please sign up, and sign up soon so my wife doesn't panic. All right? I have to live with her. You do not. (laughs) All right. 1 John chapter 3. We're in verses 11 through 18 today. Um, Would you stand, please, in honor of God's Word? We haven't done that in a while. I'd like to just stand in honor of the Holy Word of God. And let's begin with the reading of the passage. 1 John chapter 3, beginning of verse 11. The Bible says, For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he, held down, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Father, we thank you again for the holy word of God, and we pray, Father, you would open our hearts to your instruction in the name of Jesus. Amen. And you can have a seat. How do, you, how do you identify a Christian? Well, it might depend um, who you ask. If you are in the Middle East, or you ask someone from the Middle East or in the Far East, then they would answer, how do you identify a Christian by this, an American passport? Seriously. To some places in the world, if you speak American English, then you're automatically a Christian. We obviously know that's not true. I was told when in some close sharing the Lord and, and doing ministry in cl- countries that we consider closed to the gospel, where it's dangerous to not wear any Christian symbol nor even any American symbol because of the dangers that, an atten- that it might cause or the attention it might draw. Throughout history, people have used different symbols or signs to identify or show that they're a Christian. They've Throughout history, had marks on lapels. They've hung chains around their necks. They've wore special haircuts, special types of clothes, you name it. In the second century, when Roman persecution was extreme, uh, Christians adopted a symbol that you're probably familiar with. It's called the fish. It was adopted in the second century by Christians persecuted by the Romans. They would use this particular symbol because it didn't draw quite as much attention as the cross. One ancient story, whether it's true or not, I am not 100% sure, but it is an ancient story that's been told many times, says that when a Christian would meet a stranger on the road, they would draw one of the arcs of the fish. And if the stranger drew the other arc to connect them and make the fish symbol, then they knew they were in safe company. The use of a fish was an easy choice. I mean, after all, most of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. Jesus did some of his most miraculous things around fish, did he not? He fed the 5,000 or what could have been 20,000, depending on how you count, 
with the five loaves and two fish, the miraculous catch of fish, if you remember. And even after his resurrection, what did he feed his disciples? Fish. In fact, he told them, he would, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Fish was a good symbol. But the most unique reason is the word itself. The word for fish in the Greek language is ichthus. That's the pronunciation of fish. And the spelling in the Greek language forms an acrostic with this phrase, Isus Christos Theos Eos Soter, which means Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. That's the acrostic. Each one of those letters stands for the first letter in that phrase, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So it was a really cool thing to adopt. Well, that's all pretty cool. I mean, that's neat stuff. But there's a better sign of a Christian. It's not a sign that was used in any particular time period of history. It's not a sign that's associated specifically with culture. It's not a sign chosen or designed by man, not even the church. It's the sign Jesus gave us himself right before he went to the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I've loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Do you see the sign Jesus gave us? That was his sign. He said, my sign about whether or not you can be identified as a Christian, as a Christ follower, as one of my disciples is whether or not you love one another. It's the practice of your love. Love is the primary characteristic, the mark of a genuine Christian. Consider how many passages, scriptures, how many times in the New Testament Christians are commanded to love. I'm going to just give you a Here's just a sample. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Ephesians 1, 1 through 2, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Peter writes in his first letter, verse 22, chapter 1, having purified your souls by your your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Paul writes in Thessalonians, his first letter, chapter 4, verse 9, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. He also said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is what? Love. It's just a tiny sample. And it's everywhere in the New Testament. And as John says in our passage that we just read, it is not a novel idea. It is the command from the beginning. The beginning of what? From the very beginning of the teaching of Jesus. This characteristic, however, is the opposite of the world's characteristic. Now, we pick it up in verse 11 today, um, but verse 11 is an outflow from where we ended in verse 10. Where he ended in verse 10, he's been talking about the characteristics of believers in contrast with unbelievers. And he says... Verse 10, this is evident, we, who are children of God and who are children of the devil, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And so from there, he picks up again on this issue of love. Now, remember what we're talking about. With children of God, there is a fellowship. So in our series, it's called Lifeline. Fellowship is our lifeline. It is intimacy with God and with other believers, and from that fellowship is a shared life experience that produces joy, purity, wisdom, and confidence. That's what Paul or what John is teaching us throughout his letter, and we're in that third section, the longest section. It's about wisdom. And in that section, John is saying, look, there's only two families on this earth. There's only two people, really, that God identifies only two, the children of God and the children of Satan. Those who are in God's fellowship should be wise enough to tell the difference. That's what he's talking about in this third section. If you have fellowship with God and with one another, with other true believers, then you should be able to tell the difference between those who are true believers and those who are not, between what is right and what is wrong. God's voice and Satan's voice. John continues to examine this contrast, and for us it might get somewhat repetitive, but he wants to drive it home. 
John loves using contrast throughout the letter, and so he continues. And the first thing he teaches us here is that children of Satan are characterized by hatred. Now John said in the previous verses that there is a lifestyle difference between the world and followers of Christ. We just read that in verse 10. Followers of Christ practice righteousness, what is right, and in practicing what is right, we love one another. It's not enough, John is saying, to believe rightly, one must behave rightly. Being produces or precedes doing. What we do is because of who we are. And so that's where John is going next. If we are a, uh, in one family, it, that ought to produce in us a certain way of life. We ought to reflect it. If we're in the family of God, we ought to reflect that we are. We ought to do what or who we are. John says, <clears throat> let me give you two examples of those who did what they were. If being precedes doing, then they did who they really were. One is Cain, by the way, and the other one, I'll go ahead and tell you, is Jesus. Both are given as examples here. He begins with Cain. Cain is a perfect illustration of children of the devil. So let's look at his story. Go with me, just put a marker here or something. Go with me to Genesis chapter 4. So let's do a little background first and see what he's talking about. Cain, first son of Adam and Eve, and Abel, their second we read about here in Genesis chapter 4. Beginning of verse 1, Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain... Time came, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, if you like to keep notes, underline things in your Bible, I want you to circle or make note of the word firstborn and fat portions, and I'll explain that in a minute. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Cain was angry. His face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, <clears throat> sin is crouching at the door. It's desires for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Cain and Abel <clears throat> had the same parents, first two parents. They had the same instruction about how to worship God. What God required. Both brought sacrifices to God under that instruction. But the sacrifices they brought were different. God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he didn't accept Cain's. Scripture says. Why? Why, why would he, if they both brought sacrifices, why did he accept Abel's but not Cain's? Both raised by the same parents, given the same instruction. But note, their, we, we, their sacrifices are different. We're not told exactly or specifically the exact reason why God rejected one over the other, but the Scripture does point out some differences. So, <clears throat> what might those particular differences be? Well, Abel brought an animal sacrifice. When Adam and Eve sinned, God killed animals to make coverings for them. Death was the only just punishment for sin. And sacrifice was God's gracious way of satisfying His justice but offering forgiveness. But I had you point out a couple of other things. because This, is, I think, is even what makes it more clear. And that is, when they brought things, notice that Abel brought the firstborn and the fat portions. What that meant to the Jewish people was, the first to the Jewish people was always the best. Whatever is first, I give to God. Whatever I produce, whatever I achieve, whatever I gain, the first is God's. The first portion always goes to Him. In other words, in, in, in the principle or practice of tithing, for example, the first check I write is the one to God. He's first. Not my light company, not anybody else. <clears throat> not my car payment. That, that God gets it first. That's what that meant. He's first. The other part was the fat. Now, we don't, might not consider fat a good thing, but the Jews thought it was awesome. 
to them, the best part, the flavor of the meat is in the fat. And it is. The flavor of meat is in the fat. And so the flavorful part, the best part, that the, to the Jews, that was the richest part. So what did Abel bring and give to God? Turn over. This ain't for me. I don't consume this. I give this over to God completely. He gave him the first and he gave him the best. Cain gave God something. And that's basically what the text says. Cain gave him something. Abel gave him the first and the best. Cain ignored the commands of God that apparently they both knew. And he went with what we might identify as his own self-styled religion. They were both given right instructions. God accepted one over the other because Abel did what God required. He did what God was right. Cain did what he wanted to do. Abel also offered his sacrifice by faith, we are told. Cain brought. <clears throat> Cain, Cain thought his efforts were good enough. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, but which he commended as righteous. God commending him as accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Well, we're also told what happens... Next, God confronted Cain. Cain. He gave Cain an opportunity to repent. God approached Cain and says, Hey, what's going on? Listen, don't you recognize that if I didn't accept what you offered to me, it wasn't done right? In other words, there's sin going on in your heart? Get it right, or it'll master you. God was offering Cain an opportunity to repent. And what did Cain do instead? He murdered his brother as if to say to God, Look, you want a blood sacrifice? Here it is. So John asked this rhetorical question back in 1 John. Why? We shouldn't be like Cain. Why did he murder his brother? Well, that's the rhetorical question. And he answers it. Because Cain's deeds were evil, Abel's were righteous. And then notice John goes on to say, so don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. When you live righteously, listen to me, church, when you live righteously, the world will hate you. And in our particular culture and in our particular nation, that's going to get worse. The more righteous that we seek to live, or just maintaining the righteousness even that we have, as the world continues to decay into the abyss around us, the world will hate you and hate you more. Why does the world hate you? Because it hates you. It hates you because its father is the devil. And the devil hates you because the devil hates the Lord. Look with me in John chapter 15, verse 18. Okay, so look that up. Let's look that together. So go back to the left. If you're back over in 1 John again, you won't have to go too far. You might want to make notes in your study of 1 John about those two passages we mentioned. When he mentioned Cain, you could write out beside if you like our references. Put out Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. And then over here where we're at now, you could write this passage, John 15, 18 through 25, because John is referring to this, this passage. And he says... <clears throat> In John 15, John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Jesus speaking, if you're using a red letter edition, that should be in red letters for you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as it is its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master? <clears throat> If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had come and spoken them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I, do not, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Theologian Martin Niemöller once said, The fellowship of Jesus has no promise that it will ever be in the majority. We must guard against thinking that there can ever be any kind of human security or assurance against the world's hatred. 
We are persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. It is indeed a conquered world which seeks to terrify us, a condemned and dying hatred which attacks us. And so John is saying in our letter, hey, don't be caught off guard and stoop to their level. That's the way they live. See, if you live righteously, they're going to hate you. But don't respond to their hatred with hatred. That's the way the world does it. That's what he's saying. Your flesh will want to respond that way. But, but listen, you've been changed by the gospel and you have the power to overcome that temptation by the Holy Spirit in you. You have, have been empowered to live differently. We know we've been changed. We know we have eternal life. Why? How? John says when we love one another. He's not saying that if you love one another, you can have eternal life. He's saying that if you have eternal life, it'll be evidenced by whether or not you love one another. The great pastor Adrian Rogers once said, he said, love is not the way to God. God is the way to love. Now, then he brings this part up because Jesus addressed it as well in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Well, what's he, I mean, what's he, what's he getting at here? <clears throat> I mean, most, most folks don't, don't murder, right? I mean, not, not literally. <laughs> so, what does he mean? Well, the Bible tells us that the attitude of hate in the heart is the equivalent of murder. The desire to get rid of somebody. The desire or the hope that they disappear and go away and not be around anymore. That's hate. And it's the first step towards murder. Jesus said in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, You have heard that it is said to our ancestors, Do not murder. Whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, You moron, will be subject to hellfire. The issue is not what did you do. The issue is... What did you want to do? What was your desire? Hatred is no different than murder, and no murderer possesses, the Scripture says, eternal life. That that isn't to say that a believer can never sin with a sin of hatred, nor is it to say that a murderer can't be forgiven and get eternal life. What he's saying is that those who are characterized by a lifestyle of hatred are not going to go to heaven unless they repent. I remember hearing about a woman who went to the doctor. She'd been bitten by a rabid animal. And the doctor said to her, I hate to tell you this, but you have rabies. And so immediately she took out a piece of paper and a pen and began writing things. And he, he said, wait, wait, what are you doing? Are you, you don't have to write out your will yet. She's, she, he said, are you writing out your will? She says, no, I'm, writing, I'm making a list of the names of people I want to bite. There are people just like that. Filled with hatred, God writes it down as murder. Children of Satan are characterized by hatred. Children of God, however, the Scripture says, are characterized by love. By this we know love that He laid down, verse 16, He laid down His life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Loving others means dying to self, Charles Spurgeon said in a sermon from the passage that we are studying today, he said, Ah, Lord Jesus, I never knew thy love till I understood the meaning of thy death. How true that is. If you were asked this question, how would you respond? The question, could you state the core of your belief? Could could you paraphrase? Could Could you really state In summary, what is the core of your belief? The brilliant theologian Karl Barth was once once asked that question. He was asked that question by a student. He was lecturing at Union Seminary in Richmond, and he said, "Would would you state for us the core of your belief? And here's what he said. He said, yes, I think I could summarize my theology in these words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the core of my theology. If you want to know what love is, John says, just look at the cross. 
When we're singing that song, James, you know, I'll never know how, how, how much to let, you know, about the cross. And I just, I let my eyes drift to, you know, our, our symbol. I just kept staring, staring at it and staring at it and thought, man, how true that is. How true we'd never, we just never will fully grasp it. I don't even think in heaven we'll fully grasp it. We still won't know it fully. We'll know more than we know now. How great that love is. How Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of God, could step into my place and die as our substitute on a cross for our sins. His self-sacrifice for, for me and for you who are totally unworthy. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? John is saying, if we truly understand what Jesus has done for us, then we will be willing to lay down our lives in His service. Warren Wearsby says, self-preservation is the first law of physical life. That makes sense. He said, however, self-sacrifice is the first law of spiritual life. Folks, <clears throat> talk is cheap, is it not? Saying, well, I love everybody. <clears throat> Sometimes saying we love everybody may be an excuse for not loving anybody, specifically. Like the little boy who said, Mommy, I love mankind. It's people I don't like. That's where John is. <clears throat> that's what John is talking about in verse 17. If anyone has, so he says, well, that's, so let me just, I mean, talk is cheap. Let me illustrate. We can say we do, but then we really don't love anybody. Unless, he says, if anyone has, his, the, has the world's goods, sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart to him, here's his question rhetorically, how does God's love abide in him? Loving means dying to self, and that translates into service. John says, look, if you see somebody in need and you close your heart to them, then you reveal the truth of your heart. And what you're revealing in the truth of your heart is that God's love is missing from it. And if God's love is missing from it, then the gospel's missing from it, which means eternal life is missing from it. That's his next rhetorical question. If someone is in genuine need and we understand that they really are, legitimately, and at the same time, we have, the, we have the ability to help them, but we turn away, then we reveal that we have an absence of God's love in us. Now, does that mean that you have to like everybody? Well, now it's quiet. Oh, crud, what's he going to say? <laughs> I'm scared. Does it mean i got to like everybody because I'm in trouble? Because <laughs> you don't like everybody, do you? No. And by the way, they don't all like you either. <laughs> I think, does it mean everybody has to like everybody? I think the answer is no. We don't all have the same behavior. We don't all have the same ideas. We don't all have the same preferences. You will like some more than others, and as I mentioned, there will be people who don't like you either. But listen, but loving, love is not a matter of personal preference. God calls me to love even those I don't like. Loving goes beyond the preference and sees the person as someone God loves. Remember, I've given you a definition of love over and over and over again for I think last Sunday or this Sunday is my eight-year anniversary as your pastor. And I've said it over and over and over again. <clears throat> what love is. It's an unconditional choice of the will that results in action for the benefit of somebody else. It's not built on emotion. It's not built on like. It's not built on preferences. It's a choice of the will that results in an action for someone else's benefit, whether I like them or not. While we were His enemies, Christ died for us. Love overcomes all those things. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is, love is, love is, love is, love is. Basically summarized in this. No excuses, no obstacles, no nothing. Hatred is the opposite of love. It's driven by a self, 
satisfying, self-serving, self-preservation mindset. But love is self-sacrificing. Here's what John is saying. Once I come to realize how much God loves me and what He's done for me, then I'm secure in Him. And I don't have to be self-preserving. So I don't have to be self-serving, self-preserving, self-satisfying if I know that God loves me the way He loves me. I'm preserved. My eternity is secure. My satisfaction in Him is complete. Therefore, I am free to love because the love of Christ now, as Paul says, controls me. Once William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, sent a one-word telegraph to encourage his officers all around the world. It was just one word. He sent it, and that one word was others, exclamation point. On May the 29th, 1914, the ship Empress of Ireland sank. There were 130 Salvation officers, Salvation Army officers on that ship. 109 of them drowned. When they picked up their bodies, not a single one of those 109 Salvation Army officers were wearing a life vest. Survivors said that when the ship began to sink, Salvation Army officers began taking off their life vests and looking for anybody and everybody who didn't have one and strapped it on them. From the deck of that ship, they shouted to the world the message of God's love, others. Now, we might not have to give up our life vest, literally. But we can express the love of Christ every day. And I don't think we fully realize how critical the expression of love or lack of it is. True stories. A man in California is one of those guys who's always on time, does everything just right. Businessman guy, right? And He always liked to get on the freeway early because he needed to get ahead of traffic because he never wanted to be late for work. On this particular morning, when he got up, he couldn't get his car to start, and he's concerned that he's not going to get ahead of the traffic on the freeway and then be late, and he always does things right and proper, that he asked his wife if he could borrow her car, and she said, sure. But So he got in her car, but by the time he got in her car and got on the freeway, he was behind the eight ball. In fact, he had was launched into massive traffic. And he inched along, frustrated and frustrated until it finally came, he came to a stop at in one of the world's longest parking lots. Well, while he was sitting there, frustrated that he's going to be late for work and irritated, car right behind him honked the horn. And he's like, now remember, he's already irritated. He li- I mean, he's, he's a proper guy. He, he, he likes doing things right. And now the guy behind him is honking horn at him, and he's already irritated. And so he sits there, and he's steaming a little bit, and after a little while, the guy honks the horn again. I mean, he's, nobody's moving. And he's gritting his teeth, and he said, I mean, I mean this is an executive the guy, you know, who's gritting his teeth, this is an executive. He's a member of a prominent church in California. And, and this, this guy needs to give me a break. I don't know why he's blowing his horn at me. Doesn't he see I can't move? And then that old rascal honked a horn a third time. <laughs> By now, he's angry. He's had it. <clears throat> so he throws that car in park, which he's just sitting there anyway with a foot on the brake. And he goes out, he walks to the car behind him, and he bangs on that window, and the guy rolls his window down, and he says, what's the matter with you? Can't you see I can't move? And he says a few other expletives. And the guy in the car says, what's the matter with me? Buddy, what's the matter with you? He said, what do you mean, what's the matter with me? What's the matter with you? Can't you see I can't move? He said, no, 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 what's the matter with you? There's a sticker on the back of your car that says, honk if you love Jesus. And he said, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. 
It's not enough to have a bumper sticker on your car. How are you driving it? <laughs> Some of us need to take fish stickers off the back of our car. Hello? What's John saying? John is saying, let's love, but not just in talk, but in deed and truth. The whole letter of James, when you read the book of James, he says this whole same thing. He says, I want to show you my faith by my actions. Show you the faith by how I live my lifestyle. <laughs> so this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer with this question. Lord, how's my love life? What does it say about me? What does my, the action, what does my action say about what kind of child that I am? who I belong to. Is that an expression of love or have I been, or am I being tempted to practice the things of the world? What is it that I may need to say I'm sorry for? What is it I may need to repent of? What is it in me that may need to change so that I'm sure and clear that I'm identified as a child of God, characterized by love? I hate to say it this way, but it ought to be. I guess it's true. <laughs> what is it I can do to make the world hate me more? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Let's pray. Let's pray together. I want to invite you, first of all, this morning, if, if you know the love of Jesus or you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we've mentioned earlier in the, in the message and been reminded two or three times in it that Jesus loves you. He does love you. He loved you enough to die for your sins. God created us. He made us. He told us how to live. He told us not to sin. And yet the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And yet in God's wonder, He has made a way for us to be forgiven. God's a just God. There's a price for sin. And the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. Eternal separation from God in a place called hell. God is right and He is true. <clears throat> There's only two sides, only two destinations. Heaven is reserved for those who would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior by asking His forgiveness, trusting that Jesus died for their sins and that He rose from the dead and saying, Lord, I want, I want you in my life. I want you to be control, not me. I want to live for you, not of the world. That's a choice. You don't have the ability to do it first. You can't say, okay, I'll get my life right and then we'll get this settled. You can't. You have to ask Him to change you. And if you have not done that, whether you're here this morning or you're listening online with us, I want to invite you to ask Him to be your Savior today, to tell Him that you recognize, just in prayer, I don't know how to pray, just speak to Him. You can speak to Him with your eyes closed, or your eyes open, you can speak to Him a lot, oh, uh, verbally or quietly in the, in, in the recesses of your mind. You speak to yourself all the time, both ways. Speak to Him, address it to Him, tell Him you want your, His forgiveness. You know that you're accountable to Him, you need His forgiveness you do believe in Jesus. You believe He rose from the dead, just like Logan shared with us this morning. You want to surrender your life to Him. I invite you to do that. Believer, we've already talked about the things we need to be praying about and doing, and so let's address those with the Lord this morning. I want to pray, and then we're going to stand and spend a few minutes in response to the Lord. The altar is going to be open. That's just our front area. If you're a guest here, you're welcome to pray where you're at. You can come here and kneel if you like, and, and um, whether you're a guest or a member, it doesn't matter. If you have questions about how to have Jesus as your Savior or something you would like Pastor Gary or myself or one of our deacons or our wives to pray with you about, we'll be here to pray with you, standing, waiting on you. We don't know what God's saying to you. We want you to respond as He leads you. Father, I pray that you would be glorified in this moment, that, Lord, you would help us recognize how much, Lord, that you love us. I know we're, we're never going to fully grasp it. Let us grasp it more than we do now. And pray, Father, that our hearts and our lives and our minds and our words and our actions, that our lifestyle would reflect that we understand that love you have for us by in turn laying down our life, Lord, in service to you. I pray, Father, that you would help us stand bold in our faith, but yet do so with humility, graciousness, kindness, and love. I pray, Father, for someone here who doesn't know you in this moment. Lord, that they would come to know you fully. I pray, Lord, that we would be mindful that, Lord, how we live our life is witnessed by others around us, and it's important, Lord, that we reflect the gospel has changed us because only then will people come to know you. Lord, that fellow in that car behind the other guy, he might have been, it happened, so happens he was a believer, but what if he wasn't? What would he have thought as he saw that sticker, honk as you love Jesus, and, and then that guy came out and, tapped on his windshield and 
chewed him out. Lord, let, let us not be like that. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunities like you gave that man to point things out we need to repent of. We thank you for that as well. And in these moments, let us respond accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.